Hi, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. And this is Northwest Brew Talk. Welcome to Northwest Brew Talk, the number one podcast on Washington beer, brought to you by Micro Homebrew, located in Kenmore. This is episode number 81. Each and every week we promote the Washington brewing industry by talking to those people involved and drinking Washington beer. If you like Washington beer, learn about the people behind it here on our show. This week on the Micro Homebrew Interview, we talk with Diamond Knot Brewing. We also have our brew news and local music from Mercy Brown. With over 300 breweries, we try to highlight as many as possible every episode. If you're new to the show, we suggest you check out our back catalog with some great interviews and lots of Washington beer. Do you have any comments or questions? Feel free to send us an email, nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at nwbrewtalk and on Facebook at facebook.com slash nwbrewtalk. If you like the show and want to support us, share our link and tell your friends on social media. It takes just a few to start a revolution. To start the show, let's open our first beer. Is from Northwest Brewing Company, located in Pacific. They're open seven days a week, and we are drinking their Three Skulls Blood Orange Wit. It is a true Belgian-style wheat beer, brewed with wheat, pilsner, and German malts, along with rolled oats for a palate-filling experience that will leave you feeling refreshed. Flavors and aromas of citrus, banana, and spice come from this German yeast strain, hand-crushed coriander, and two types of orange peels, 5.5% ABV 20 IBUs, and an untapped rating of 3.49. All right. It is a uh, golden color here. Nice little head on it. A little foggy, too. Not quite clear. Yep. Smells good. Mm -hmm. Nice fruity smell, citrus. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. There's coriander. (laughs) Immediately you get the um Wow. You get the uh, the spices. Oh yeah. I'm just trying to taste I'm trying to taste the banana and <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's a little hint. It's not it's not real strong. Yeah, but you can taste uh it's yeah, that's what uh that's what some of these different uh yeast strains do. Mm-hmm. They really give you some different flavors. It's like really that. cool. Yeah. You know what? I think I tasted it more that time. Wow, that's funky. It's different. I like it. Yeah, it's good. I, and I like skulls, so I like skulls. And <laughs> skulls on here looks That's good. Drew you to the beer. It probably was. And Actually, blo- I think I picked this one out. <laughs> blood, blood orange wit. Yep. Nice. It's good. Um, something different. I know we've done something from Northwest before, but uh, yeah. we haven't done any of their... St- I don't think we've done any of the three skulls stuff. So um, it's good. You know, I thought the citrus taste would be a little stronger, but I'm mm-hmm. not... It's not uh, in the, your face right now. The blood orange? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so too. But no, it's good. It's a nice uh, variation from all the typical IPAs and pale ales and everything else. So yeah. Yeah, it's good. All right. And now, on to this week's brew news. Topping this week's news, the fifth annual Bellingham Beer Week starts Friday, September 9th and runs through September 18th. Events take place at breweries across the city. Colshan will have Olympic beer games, Chuck Nut, its annual Oktoberfest, among other events. Boundary Bay will also release Feme Ales, brewed by all women on September 14th. The 7th Annual Hops and Crops Music and Beer Festival takes place on Saturday, September 10th from noon to 6 p.m. at Mary Olson Farm in Auburn. Over a dozen breweries and cideries will be available. The event will have live music and food and is 21 and over. Our friends at Chuck Nut Brewery in Bellingham have opened their new production facility and tap room at the Port of Skagit. Congratulations, guys. We can't wait to stop by. Also, Victor 23 Brewing in Vancouver is now open. And that's another one we're going to have to check out. We were just down there, so it's last month. It doesn't, seem, it doesn't matter. We, j- we keep driving. <laughs> we'll be back. We'll, we'll make the back. trips. The 7th Annual Cider Summit Seattle is coming this Friday, September 9th and Saturday, September 10th at South Lake Union Discovery Center Long. The event will feature over 150 ciders from producers around the country and around the world, including regional favorites and international classics. The event is 21 and older, and general admission is 35 with VIP admission at $45. 
It's that time of the year, and September 23rd to 25th is the Fremont Oktoberfest. Hell is one of the top 10 places in the world to celebrate Oktoberfest with food, beer, and several other events to keep you busy, including a 5K and a street scramble. Friday and Saturday are 21 and older, while Sunday is all ages. This event has various ticket options, so visit StrangerTickets2.com to check it out. Saturday, September 24th is the 18th annual Fish Brewing Oktoberfest in Olympia. They will have food, special beer releases, and live music. You get a commemorative mug and three pours for your $20 admission. Piketoberfest takes place Saturday, October 1st from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. The Beer, Charcuterie, and Harvest Festival features local meats, sauerkrauts, cheeses, and more paired with craft beers, wines, and spirits. There will also be live music at the 21 and over event that benefits Pike Place Market Foundation. Beer on the Beer takes place in Anacortes, October 7th and 8th. This adult-only event will have 30 breweries and 10 cideries as well as food and live music. Tickets are $25 or $45 for both days. The third annual Prosser Beer and Whiskey Festival takes place October 8th at the Prosser Wine and Food Park. The 21 and over event features live music, food, rib cook-off, specialty vendors, VIP cigar lounge, and much more. Tickets for the event are $15 for general admission, $50 for a VIP pass, and $75 for an all-access pass. The Mountain Ale Festival takes place on October 8th in Roslyn at the Yard. The event is 21 and older and features over 15 breweries, food, lawn games, and live music. It's $25 per person and gets you five beer scrip and a souvenir tasting glass. North Bank Beer Week is taking place across southwest Washington September 22nd through the 30th. Events across the area at 27 breweries and other venues. Check northbankbeerweek.com for all the details. Several brewery, breweries opened over the holiday weekend, including Figurehead Brewing last Friday in Seattle. So we stopped by to help them celebrate. Also, they had a great turnout, and they really have some great beers. Yes, they do. We enjoyed every single one. Exactly. And on Saturday, we stopped by Decibel Brewing in Bothell for their soft opening. Nice guys and some great beer there, too. Again, yep, great beer. There's some more great beer coming into the uh, into the community. It's Definitely. exciting. Definitely. And let's see. Uh, Go Brewing in Bellevue will be celebrating their third anniversary on October 15th with a party. More details as soon as they're available. We are quite lucky here in the Northwest and specifically in Washington. We are in hop country and that means fresh hops. Fresh hop beers have to be made within 24 hours of hop cutting. So these will be super fresh. There are several Fresh Hop Festivals taking place. The Fresh Hop Ale Festival takes place October 1st in the heart of hop country, Yakima. This is the end of Fresh Hop Beer Week in Yakima, which runs September 27th through October 2nd. The Seattle Fresh Hops Festival takes place October 7th and 8th at Hale's Palladium with just released fresh hop beers from over 25 breweries benefiting the City Fruit Nonprofit. And that, my friends, is all of the events and such that's going on on this week's Brew News. So much to cover. It was. <laughs> Welcome back to Northwest Brew Talk. If you want to submit news to Northwest Brew Talk, feel free to send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. If you've not yet subscribed to our podcast, why not do it now? It's free, available anywhere you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and now Google Play Music. On this week's micro home brew interview, we're talking to Pat from Diamond Knot Brewing. We're here with Pat from uh, Diamond Knot Brewing. So, uh, t- Pat, what is your uh, title at Diamond Knot? Uh, officially, it's Vice President of Brewing Operations. This is pretty boring, but uh, <laughs> um, I started out 16 years ago. At, you know, it was just me doing everything. I had a, an assistant one day a week, uh, but we were making like 500 barrels a year. So now I've been sort of promoted out of, you know out of uh, activity, like physical activity, oh, yeah. if you will. Which is not bad. <laughs> no, no, no. We joke that we're, and we really are, but we joke that we're working on the business, not in the business. There you go. So it's kind of cliche, but it's true. Yeah. So you've been with them uh, 16 years, but uh, 
Diamond Hot's actually one of the older older breweries in the uh, state, isn't it? Yeah, it will be 22 in uh, October. Yeah. So, yeah, we had a big 20th uh, party a couple of years ago and thought, you know, after the fact that we really should have done 21st. Oh. You know, we're probably legal and all yeah. that, but... <laughs> No, it's it's uh, it's been fun. I mean, we start came from very very humble beginnings, and we're still pretty humble, or we like to think so, I guess. Yeah. So what uh, what got you involved in the brewing industry? Uh, pure serendipity. I, in fact, I just met my friend Dave last week. I haven't seen him for a long, long time, but my friend Dave had been the assistant brewer for Diamond Up. Uh, he had left, but he stayed in touch with the brewer, and I was being, was, my job was falling victim to a reorganization at Starbucks. So Dave's like, hey, get your ass down to Diamond Knot, and, uh, you know, put in an application. I thought, well, what the hell? I, I've been home brewing for five years, I guess. Okay. I thought, well, we got to lose, you know? And so I uh, met with Brian and Bob. Or, I don't know if I met Bob, Brian for sure. And uh, yeah, that offered me a job. And so, and it was great. That brewery is so awesome because it's uh, it's just an overgrown home brewery with some, you know, better toys basically. Mm -hmm. Like serious big boy toys. Yeah. But on a very, very, very small scale. Sure. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a little bit slow in the in the beginning days. We sold most of our beer outside of, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. So Bob and Brian started the brewery as about 400 feet of subleased space from this like crappy yellow beer tavern called Cheers 2. So they had the brewery in the back and they had one handle at Cheers 2 that nobody really drank because it was the yellow beer bar. Yeah. Yeah. And this is 95, so it's about, sold most of the beer out in, you know, to Seattle. Um, and then, um, when I came on, it was it was largely the same. Actually, uh, they were afforded the opportunity to buy Cheers 2 in 99, turn it into Diamond Knot. They did so. I came along in 2000. It was still kind of slow at, you know, within those four walls because it was just kind of getting going. And we brought in um, Andy Eason, who's, who's a partner now as well. Um, and he knew restaurants. Like Bob and Brian didn't know crap about running a restaurant. Uh, and he knew restaurants. And all of a sudden, we were busy to the point where I couldn't make enough beer down there just for our own faucets, let alone selling out inside. Um, so we had this genius idea to build another brewery up the hill, which we did. We went, we bought. Um, we bought a defunct brewery. Actually, it was here in Redmond, mm. and de decommissioned it and drug it up to Mukilteo, mm. and uh, spent just shy of a year on build out, and then uh, so that's our our production brewery and tap room now. Like nothing of the original equipment's left except for the brew house and the boiler. Oh really? But um, they have stall new tanks and uh, toys to go with. Yeah, we made the mistake when we were up in that area uh, on a Sunday. We drove to the production brewery. Oh, <laughs> we no. found out it's not open. Yeah, well, fortunately, the Ale House is only four miles up the road. Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we were just open limited hours there, three to eight, Friday and Saturday. But we, it's really nice because we get a huge right after work crowd, about oh, yeah. five, you know. Uh, and they hang out and have a couple beers, and then they're yeah. all gone, and our bartender can go home and hang out with her heavy, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. So what, uh, what is the big seller then at, uh, at Diamond Knot? Uh, the IPA is our, is our, you know, our big seller by, you know, threefold to its next, uh, competitor. Really? Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's effectively the same beer that we've done since day one, since 95. You know, we had tweaks here and there and improvements in process and, and such. Um, but yeah, it's, and when we started doing that beer, um, uh, nobody really did a, a um, you know an IPA as their their everyday flagship beer. Uh, most folks did them seasonally, like in the fall, and the hop crops come in, you know. Um, so we like to think we at least you know had a had a hand in the whole beginnings of the IPA revolution <laughs> here in the Northwest. There you go. 
So, but it's, you know, it's the same beer it's always been. It's really nicely balanced with the, the malt bill and, and the hops, you know. It's not going to melt enamel off your teeth, <laughs> but uh, it's just well balanced. Right. Classic Northwest. So you do, um, you do some bottling. How many different beers do you bottle? Uh, we do three styles here, uh, you know, every day. Uh, that being the IPA, the industrial IPA, and the brown ale. And then we have, uh, you know, seasonals that rotate every quarter. And we're, we're dabbling in, you know, throwing out some limited release things where um, we're going to expand on our industrial name. I don't know if you're aware of our, our industrial IPA is effectively, and it's our take on an imperial. So it's double everything, pretty much. Uh, we just recently trademarked the the term so we figure well we're going to use it and you know we're going to make industrial different like we have an industrial red industrial rye industrial brown that we haven't bottled yet but they're in kind of in the hopper okay um and uh yeah it's really fun like my um the guy that we just recently promoted to our production manager has been with me as a brewer for uh not quite 11 years um and he started, I mean, he came in and worked at the at the restaurant that when all we had was the one by the ferry. Uh, he came in as a as a server, but he's like, I want to get into that brewery, man. Yeah. And the poor guy, they threw him to the wolves. His first <laughs> night was Friday night and St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so, yeah. But Brian, you know, persevered, and now he runs the brewery, and he does a fantastic job. But short story long, um, he, uh, we just started an R&D panel so that we, we get together and we kind of study a certain style of beer. We bring examples and, and uh, you know, between the, the best tongues in, in the house, we kind of determine where we want to go with some experimental beers that we've done. And it's a lot of fun. You know, it has its moments, but... Sure. <laughs> so, when you're doing that, are you uh, buying a bunch of beers from other companies and sampling them? Or how you do, is that what you're doing? Yeah, sometimes, or at least last time, we we tasted three of our three batches of our own IPA that um, that we had treated a little bit differently each one. So we're trying out a new process, and uh, you know, trying to figure out which one was best. Um, and then, yeah, well, we're testing test ba- or tasting test batches. We got a little half barrel system okay. up on the pad we can play around with. So. So when um, when you guys brew, do you tend to brew to style, or do you like to mix it up? You know, we try to keep it in style as much as we can because we do most of our beers. We just call them what they are. We don't have like uh, as the uh, TTB calls it a fanciful name. Uh, some lately, some of our beers do, but usually, usually we just call it what it is, like IPA, brown, blonde. You know, so we do try to conform to style as best we can, but. Um, it's it's really hard. Yeah. It's half the half the game in uh, in right. entering competitions. You know, yeah. is getting it in that right category. Right. So. So have you guys uh, won any awards for any of your beers? Um, funny, we just had a discussion about that uh, the other day. You know, we we haven't won a whole lot of awards, and we really haven't entered a whole lot of competitions either. Yeah. Um, we've gone to JBF like three times, and. Uh, but, so we always joke that, yeah, we don't have many awards, but we got a crap load of empty kegs to speak for what we do, <laughs> you know? What is, uh, what's in the future for Diamond App? Well, we just, um, we just brought in a bunch of new stainless, um, 240 and 280 barrel bright tanks. Uh, expanded our production area at the production brewery. And, uh, so, you know, we're going to continue to, we're going to try and release a new can every year, uh, you know, to a certain point. And uh, just try and do our best to keep offerings fresh. And I think, quite honestly, our next, you know, we've got, we have another restaurant, brewery in our in our sites. Uh, no timeline yet, but we will go that way eventually, I think. So, in fact, we were set to do a huge brewery expansion. At the same time, when um, the opportunity to do our to create our Amelie Terrace place came up, and we made the 
you know, the strategic decision to do that, take what we were going to use for, to, for a brewery blowout and build Malik right. Terrace, uh, which I think was a great decision. And now it's, it's my turn to spend a bunch of money. <laughs> so we got all this new equipment. And then, uh, like I said, we'll eventually, as soon as the dust settles from this, we'll probably start moving toward another retail site. Amen. Okay. So would that be a full restaurant? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, most likely with a, with a fully functioning brewery in oh, it. Oh really? Yeah, because I think we we determined that you know it's partly why why people come to a the brewing company is mm -hmm. you know we want to brew, actually brew on site. Yeah. Um, so and we built our Malik Terrace brewery is definitely a, a showpiece. It's completely glassed off and it's very shiny and pretty and brand new. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Or you know it's it's two years old so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can't get uh, much fresher than that then, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, all the stainless is still super shiny and nice, and our, uh, our guy Danny down there keeps it good and clean. So, so, so if you have uh, those two locations, are, would they brew different items than, uh, than you have from pr the production facility? Yeah, so the production brewery does like all the stuff we package, like the, the large scale things. Uh, and then we use the other two, primarily the Mount Terrace Brewery, to because we have we have 16 taps at our places, so we got to keep all all of those full. Um, so we use Mount Terrace to fill in the gaps, like the beers that we don't take to to wholesale much. You know, ESB Porter Stout, you know, fun goofy experimental stuff. Uh, and now our original brewery mostly is does purely experimental things because uh, Malik Terrace can handle it the capacity of you know keeping the taps full for us so we go down the hill and play <laughs> so are you guys uh, have you or are you plan on doing any type of barrel project yeah we've got some barrels going right now it's really really limited at this point um, but quite frankly, we've spent a lot of time in the past years just just fighting to keep up with our regular program, you know. So now we've got an opportunity to again, you know, do some playing around. So we're uh, we've got some barrel aged stuff um, in barrels right now, and then a couple batches that are aging in kegs. So it'll be again, it'll be like you know, there's like eight kegs. So we'll probably just pour it in our places where we can. Keep it, you know, under control and keep an eye on it and make right. sure that it doesn't go sideways. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. But we've, um, yeah, like I said, I've, I've wanted to do barrel aged stuff for a long time, it's just never have yeah. the time, frankly. Yeah. And still don't have much time for it. <laughs> yeah, well, more and more these days, thankfully, or, you know, our guys do, because there's enough of us that we can, we can keep them engaged by doing fun shit like that so yeah. it's not just you know the the drudgery every day yeah right, right. So. so uh one other thing um you have a side job here uh you were playing a little earlier on uh drums with uh your band huh yeah yeah it's definitely more of a hobby than a job but uh <laughs> Uh, we do get paid for this gig, so there I guess go. I'm gonna have to claim it on my, <laughs> my taxes next year. <laughs> so yeah, we have a blast. I mean, I played drums when I was much younger, and then didn't for 20 odd years. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna buy a drum set and I'm gonna put it over. We have a, a storage unit, like big half a building, right next to the brewery, where we keep all our cans and glass and stuff. There's like a loft. I guess I'm gonna put it over there and just go beat the crap out of it when I have a bad day, you know, and it'll be fun. All of a sudden, somebody's like, well, hey, I play some guitar, and oh, I play a bass, and I, I can sing. Like, all of a sudden, there's a band. I'm like, shit, sweet. Nice. Uh, so, yeah, we've been together in this iteration for just over a year. Played probably six or eight gigs out. It's a lot of fun, you yeah. know? really a good opportunity to get out and just you know have, have fun with it it's all we're about I, I did find i think it was your second song an interesting choice uh war pigs oh yeah that's a standard <laughs> people love that song too so it's uh it's a bit dark for sure but oh yeah i was like i'm like that's starting i go that uh that's definitely an interesting choice but that's yeah my like that's the one i will not let drop off the cell oh, yeah. it was really fun for me to play because oh, there's yeah. a lot of drumming in it 
Yeah. Nice. It's not just like you know you're keeping keeping time. Nice. So. Awesome. Well, Pat, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. Cheers. All right, thanks to Pat from Diamond Knot for joining us today. If you're a home brewer looking for a great shop to buy your home brew ingredients and equipment, why don't you check out Micro Homebrew in Kenmore? Tony and his staff are always happy to help a new or experienced home brewer find what they need. At Micro Homebrew, they're proud to carry over 100 hop varieties. Visit them today at 17511 68th Avenue Northeast in Kenmore. Or find them on Facebook at Micro Homebrew. When you stop in, make sure you tell them that you heard about them on Northwest Brew Talk. And remember, they have wine making, cider making, and cheese making equipment, among other things, too. Definitely check them out on Facebook. We'll be right back after a local music break from Mercy Brown.
That was Where the Fire Is by Mercy Brown. You can check them out at ReverbNation.com slash Mercy Brown Official. If you want to have your music played on Northwest Brew Talk, contact us today. Hi, I'm Mike Rizzo, author of Washington Beer, a heady history of Evergreen State Brewing. The history of brewing in Washington dates back to when the area was just a territory. My new book, Washington Beer, tries to cover everything from the 19th century to modern days. American Craft Beer said, quote, author Michael F. Rizzo does the considerable legwork for us in Washington Beer, unquote. Through dozens of photos and detailed notes, the history slowly evolves. W.A. List said, quote, Michael Rizzo takes the name a Washington Beer game to a whole other level, unquote. From Prohibition to the modern craft beer movement, over 300 brewery histories are explored. One of craft beer's pioneers, Mari Kemper from Chuckin' Up Brewery, said, quote, He's done a noble job of trying to reconstruct the industry's history from oral stories and bits and pieces of written documentation. A great read for anyone interested in finding out how the beer industry developed in Washington State, unquote. From Arcadia Publishing, the book features a 16-page color insert and costs $21.99. You can pick up a copy at your local bookstore, online, in ebook format, or directly from me, autographed. Get your copy today. We get to thank McMenamins for our next beer. McMenamins has six brewery locations in Washington. The exciting thing about this beer is their cans. They've released just two of their beers in these 16-ounce cans, including this one, their Ruby Ale. One of their most popular standards, they still make Ruby Ale with the same aims they had when brewing the first batch back in March of 1986 to create an ale light, crisp, and refreshingly fruity. Great Western Premium 2-Row and 42 pounds of organ-grown and processed raspberry puree is used to craft every colorful batch. Simple, but delicious. 4% ABV 5 IBUs and an untapped rating of 3.55. All right, this has an amazing aroma. Oh, wow. It smells like raspberries. Oh, it smells like raspberries. <laughs> it's, it's got a, a pinkish hue to it. It uh, almost looks like some of the ciders, like the cherry ciders we've tried. Yeah, you're right. Maybe a little lighter than that, but yep, yeah, it's pretty close there. Um, that's really tasty, too. <laughs> yeah, raspberry and a ton of malt at the end. Yeah, mm-hmm. wow, yeah, very good. Light, it's light though. It's not. It's nothing oh, no. heavy. It's no, yeah, really good. It's really good. It's really good. Mm-hmm. And the ca- the can is pretty cool too with this witchy woman. Mm-hmm. I love they, that. They sent us a, an or, an ornament mm-hmm. along with this can of beer, which was really cool. Yep. And uh, yeah, we're really excited. And this is some great beer. Yeah, I like this. Um, if you don't like fruit beers, you might not like it, but. Uh, this yeah. is this is awesome, and I love the malt flavor just sitting in your mouth afterward. Uh huh. Yep. Definitely. Wow, that's really good. <clears throat> that's nice. And thanks again for that too. But uh, yeah, you can pick up these cans at, uh, at any of the McMenamin's locations. So check that out if you're interested in trying it. I want you to give me fresh beer. <laughs> you serious? <laughs> no. This week's Spotlight Indie Beer Release is from Five Rights Brewing. They've just released their Juice Groove IPA, a departure from their typical dry West Coast IPA. This IPA features four different tropical and juicy hop varieties that are coupled with a Northeast IPA yeast strain to create an incredibly delicious and refreshing hop-forward beer lover's delight. 7% ABV 54 IBUs and no untapped rating yet, but I did scroll through with the few ratings that are there and most of them are four and up well, that's uh that's pretty cool so it's promising <clears throat> yeah because that's that's something that you notice we talked about over the weekend generally uh any of the beers that we've uh, that we've talked about that are graded high they're usually high threes they're like three eights, three nines. There's not a ton of fours or uh, or above. Yep. Yeah, usually, if if I if we get a beer that's um that I've seen between like let's say three point six and up, and usually, I mean, it's pretty tough to find a four. Mm-hmm. So usually, it's a great beer. So if I see it and it's a three point six or up, then I'm like, okay, this is gonna be a great beer. Mm-hmm. Although you know, you can't always judge. You know what? What one person we've talked about this before too. What one person thinks is a one star because it's not their kind of beer, mm-hmm. it won't necessarily be. So I mean, it can right. the grade can come down a little bit because of that. Right. Because I'm sure that people are grading it. I would like to think, or I would like to not think. 
<laughs> really that they're grading it based on how they like it um, based on style. You know, they try a porter and they say, well, this really sucks. It's not my thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm giving it a one star, even though right. it's an awesome beer. Right. You know, um, you know, there are people that do that. Though. Oh, of course. And I mean, I mean, I guess that's the way that it's supposed to be. I, mm-hmm. I'm not really sure. I would like to think that that's not how it's supposed to be, that you're supposed to be able to say, you know, it's a great beer. It's not my thing. I'm not going to give it a one star just well, because, exactly. <laughs> you know, but I, I don't know. That's uh uh, yeah. That's tough to say. It's yeah, we talked about that. I don't. I don't give a ton of uh, f- of over fours at all. Or yeah, I'm or a pretty fives. high grader. <laughs> yeah, <so laughs> I'm pretty much like you're everything. You're skewing so I'm like, all those grades. Up. <laughs> well, you know what? A lot of times, if I don't like something, it's not that it's a bad beer. No. If I thought it was a bad beer, then I would give it a worse grading. Exactly. When I think that they're good beers and maybe just not exactly my thing, mm-hmm. then I'll give it a lower grade. Lower to me being like three. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, a lot of mine I do a lot of between three. If I if I like, it's between three, five, and four. Yeah, I think I think every beer we had over the weekend I gave fives to. Yeah, I know we had some good beer. We did have some good beer. All right, and my friends, that brings us to the end of this episode of Northwest Brew Talk. Make sure you tune in next week when we chat with Bainbridge Brewing. Thanks to our sponsor, Micro Homebrew. The show is written and produced by Michelle Rizzo and myself. If you want to contact us, feel free to email us at nwbrewtalk at gmail.com or contact us on Twitter at nwbrewtalk. Our theme music is from Gilbert Neal. Check him out at gilbertneal.com. Until next time, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. Stay Stay hopping, hopping, my friends. friends. Our friends at Chuck Nut Brewery in Bellingham have opened their new production. What is wrong with this one? We promote the Washington Brewing (coughs) Institute. Each and every week, we promote...